great to be here. It really is. I, to see this kind of a crowd, especially during a snowstorm, it doesn't seem weird that every place I go, storms kind of follow me. It almost seems uh, yeah, to me that perhaps I bring this upon myself. But uh, I'm thrilled to be here today and uh, forgive the mask. Uh, family about five days ago had a positive COVID test, so I want to make sure everybody's safe. So I won't be doing any hugs or handshakes today. Uh, I feel great, though. And uh, in fact, I, I actually made it through my tax appointment today, too, in Saginaw. So I'll all I did was I kept thinking, I'm going to see my friends in Bay City. I'll make it through this. I'll make it through this. But uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be sharing my amazing, cool lighthouse mask that Marsha made for me. And this story uh, for me has been just a fantastic um, look back into some of the lighthouses that maybe don't get as much love. If you've seen, how many people by hands have seen the Saginaw River range light? Oh, perfect. Yeah, so many of you, but you know it's kind of off the beaten path. You can't just get there, and that's something that this incredible group has been working not only to create a museum that will happen out there, but also better access, so that'll be happening as well. So think about a membership. I think it's a, a big part of allowing them to grow and to get the attention that Dow needs to see to, to uh, know that this is important to the people of Bay County especially, but especially around this area <laughs> where we don't have a lot of lighthouses right here, but we certainly have them around the lakes. I say which ones don't get attention, but I'm, I'm on the board at Whitefish Point. Whitefish Point gets a lot of attention. I mean, they get millions of visitors that come up, um, but there's many of these lighthouses that were put out in the middle of the lake to warn uh, pilots, uh, the, the captains, of huge mountaintops that appear in the middle of Lake Superior, Lake Huron. And these places are so far out that only people that can actually take a boat out there or an airplane in many cases can see it, and very rarely can you get access inside. So I thought, why don't we do a little bit about that, but don't let me do all the talking. Um, you heard the trivia today, so if you remember this guy right here, good to see you, by the way, Bill. This is like a, a reunion. Bill, I work with SGW. Jeff Jenkins is here from Channel 5 and 12. Um, this guy is an early picture of Cass. And if you know the story of Cass, and I'm just trying to set up a timeline for you here, 1820 is when he came to the Sioux and basically was trying to chase the British out. Now, we'd already beat them in the, well, it was a stalemate, if you ask any Canadian, on the War of 1812. But um, it, Drummond Island would still be inhabited by the British. So his job was to come up and build a fort, get property from the Native Americans that are up there. And he actually went up, if you've ever heard the story, one of the Native American chiefs raises a, a British flag right in front of him and <laughs> brings it up. So what is he gonna do? He's carrying a gun, he's carrying a sword. He throws his sword on the ground. He walks over to the Union Jack and he lowers it down and he stamps on it right in front of the chief. And all the other chiefs are all gathered together. And he says, this will never happen in the United States of America. So it was an interesting turn of events where he did get permission to put the fort up there, which as we know it, um, was up there forever, really, until the college came. And that's the, uh, the, the grounds now that uh, the college has up there, Lake Superior State. So 1820, this is how far we're taking it back. This is literally, we're a territory. We're not even a state yet. And this is where we start seeing a lot of shipping coming up through here. And our first lighthouses are being built, St. Joseph, Bo uh, Boblo Island. Boys Blanc is how they say it up there. Boblo, if you're down here. <laughs> which means white trees, by the way, if you will ever wonder what Bablo means, probably for the birch trees that are on those islands. So down here, first island light that we built, and in Thunder Bay in 1831, this is where all that traffic's coming up. And finally, the walk in water, the first steamship, um, on the upper Great Lakes at least, starts making a, a, almost uh, three times a year up to the, the straits here. So this gets very busy, and they start to realize that especially on this side as they start to go into Green Bay, still doing a lot of the fur trade back then, and eventually down into Chicago and St. Joe, this is a dangerous area. So they figured we've got to do something coming through the straits. So here's where our beautiful Mackinac Bridge is now. Here's the island. You can smell the fudge right there. <laughs> <laughs> and you go through to right past St. Helena Island. And as you get out to this, this far, um, this would be on the, the far western um, part of the straits, they would normally hug around the corner here at Wagashants, and Wagashants is actually a combination of a Native American word and a, um, a French term. Uh, Wagouche is fox, and Chance means cove, so this is Fox Cove is the name, but it, it becomes known as Wagashants, which is one of the craziest names. Skilligali is down here too, so these French terms are pretty crazy to remember. But Wagashants is, at first they figure the easiest way to do this is to actually have a light ship. If they could just park a boat there, it'd be a lot cheaper 
cheaper than building what would essentially require them building their own island or crib over here. And the, the problem is that the island for Wagashants is down here and the Rose Shoal is up in here. So the real dangers are farther away. So what do you do? You have to go into deep enough water for a boat. And this is a, a, a model of the very first boat. They designed it very poorly, it, uh, quite honestly. It's too small. It, uh, in big waves, it would rock so bad that the light would go out. So it wasn't really good for you know big storms. But this is our first prototype for a light ship on the Great Lakes, a portable lighthouse that really their job is to pull up drop the anchor and they don't leave. There is no power on here. There's no propeller. So these early light ships were dropped off and you had to fend for yourself. If you had real bad problems, I guess you could always abandon ship, but the lifeboat is not where you want to be. I think I'd just stay right at the ship. But this was about $10,000 to build the McLean, another $20,000 in maintenance, and it was getting expensive. And they thought the best thing we could do because it was putting itself out is to build an actual lighthouse out there. So the plans came out, and in the initial newspapers that you see, this is a good price, $25,000. Now, of course, it's eight times what a normal lighthouse might cost. If you look, uh, Whitefish Point here, here is kind of remote, so that one was going to cost $5,000 every one of these prices are all pipe dreams. I mean, there, there's no way they're gonna build a lighthouse for this price. 25,000 was their initial quote, and this is what they initially wanted to build, but they realized in order to, to really give it um, some kind of structure up there, especially on that side of the lake where the storms would hit and the ice would hit, they would need a crib that would be around this too. And they also needed more real estate on here to put a foghorn because if you've ever been up to the Mackinac Bridge during the fog season, the bridge disappears. So this is a horrible place during the fall or during the fog to come in. So eventually they did put a crib on there. So here's our initial price of 25,000. The real price today on the Price is Right is $306,000 to build this. And everybody in Congress was up in arms. If you look at the, the, the different, uh, um, the, there's actually um, one of the state senators, and I'm trying to remember his name, that actually said, this is an important thing we need to build. He's the one that caught all the heat. For, he's from Grand Rapids. And when this thing just kind of spiraled out of control, I think they really did get a good feeling for what it was going to cost. And look at Whitefish did. Here's the $5,000 quote and everything they added. They're into the $48,000 on that one. $180,000 just in crib repairs. So they build this crib right here. And very soon after, they realize that this, the, the lake is eating pieces of this as fast as they can put it up. So very much a problem. Here you see the fog building we put on the, the traditional stripes for the day mark. This is so that you can see a lighthouse and instantly know where you're at. The same is true with the flashing of the light. It has a very distinctive flash pattern so that at nighttime you can tell, especially as you look into the straits today with all the other lights that are there, you want to know which one is on your left and which one is on your right. So it's important to know what that is. When it was first put out, they had a little tiny bell on there and one of the sailors, uh, the captain said, it's very little better than a cow bell. And they finally did uh, a better uh, um, foghorn that was put up there, thank heavens. Um, but by 1911, they realized that most of the heavier ships now were getting into steel ships. We're going well north of some of these shoals. Shoal one, two, and three were found here. And they wanted to go out to where they would turn at a can buoy right here and then thread their way through Gray's Reef. And this is a pretty difficult passage too. In fact, uh, for decades, we didn't have that cleaned out. So there was a lot of ships that were snagged up here on Gray's Reef and especially before we actually got a, um, an actual uh, uh, lighthouse. So Shoal, White Shoal had a light ship, Gray's Reef had a light ship, and we had that Wagashans light ship for a little bit. But eventually they did dredge this out in 37 where it was a little safer to go in with a thousand foot passage to go through. So now they don't need the Wagashans light anymore. What are they gonna do with this old lighthouse? Well, it turns out if you paint it with this distinctive markings for the early television cameras, 1944 television cameras, it makes a great bomb target. And that's exactly what they did was they would line up on this lighthouse and their early drones that they built out of Taylorcraft aircraft out of Ohio, they would fly these in with inert bombs on them, 500 pounders, and they would try to launch them to hit here. And they really didn't do very well with the drones at all. They were called glom, uh, glom gliders um, that were actually only used by the uh, aileron. You could only, I think, go up and down with a gyro to make you stay on target. So not very accurate. And you can watch as we go here. Let's see if we can fly. We're coming in on the lighthouse now in some early footage. Fly the drone? Yep, this is flying along right next to it. 
And you can see that pattern is what is allowing them the contrast and that pattern allows them to line up. Now you're actually seeing an airplane come in and it's gonna drop ordnance. And this was done all the way through. The machine gunning was all done on the uh, Wagashans Island and Hog Island. And here's where they were dropping torpedoes and bombs. And uh, this is pretty cool. This is a, unfortunately a direct hit. So here's one of our treasures, one of three that I know of birdcage lights and they're blowing it up. So divers have always told me that they there's torpedoes and bombs around there. I said, oh, come on, that's a wife's tale. But sure enough, there's bombs around here. There's at least two 500 pounders and I think a 700 pounder and then a torpedo head that was down there. So the ordnance teams came up and sure enough, they find them down on the bottom. But when they blew them up, they found out there was just sand in them. So it was nothing that they had to worry about. <clears throat> but certainly if you're a diver and you're going down there, and um, you shouldn't take anything off the bottom, obviously, but don't ever take a bomb home. That's <laughs> not a good, a good thing at all. Here's, uh, unfortunately, the state of the light. And again, it has that traditional birdcage, which was pretty popular in the early years, but um, pretty much outmoded. I think we have another one up um, in Wisconsin off of Door County is where the only other one that I know of. I think there might be another one in New York too, but the bedrooms were up top here and they had a dormer that came off the top here. And all of this stuff has kind of fallen into the lake. All of the sheathing that came around here, which was built in Detroit, all fallen into the lake. And unfortunately they tried to get a team together not to rebuild the lighthouse, but just shore it up so that, you know, it could be preserved the way it is. And sadly, they started to find out that even the limestone blocks, these are blocks that were actually cut out of quarries at Sandusky near where Cedar Point is. Um, this, they're falling into the lake now and the, the, the effort to really even uh, just kind of shore it up has pretty much failed, unfortunately. So it's only a matter of time, I'm sure. So if you look in the newspapers and they say, Spectacle Reef is a very dangerous shoal on Lake Huron, scarcely second in importance to Wagashans and probably more dreaded by navigators than any danger now on Mark. These are two areas that um, really after the lighthouse at Wagashans is built, we see dozens of shipwrecks, including the, the big North American ran aground there with 300 uh, um, uh, passengers on board. And that's usually when Congress starts to really understand maybe there's a problem when they have that many of the voters that are on board to actually uh, get it fixed. But Spectacle Reef is another very interesting reef. It's right on the far opposite end. So if Wagashans is over here, let's go to the east side now as you go in. So you're coming off the expanse of Lake Huron, going into the straits as it starts to narrow. And as you do go into that water, it's about 300 feet deep, 280 feet deep. And then these two big peaks come up and they look just like eyeglasses. That's why they call it Spectacle Reef. So you've got these two big circles of rocks there that you could see even from the surface of the water and uh, that's where it got its name from. Of course, when they go to build it, they had five or six shipwrecks that were happening in that immediate time, but there's been a dozen shipwrecks there. And as soon as Congress said, we've got the money to build the lighthouse, another shipwreck runs aground right where they're gonna build the lighthouse. So there's, there's never been a better example of what they, you know, literally why they need to build that. Uh, the guy that was the captain, Captain McDonald, actually Captain Christie was on board this vessel and he had to actually put the crew, because it snagged right on the reef and they got into the lifeboat and they had to go 12 miles into Mackinac. And uh, that's a heck of a coast. If you read though later on, this is why I love searching on the internet where you can type in, you know, tell me Captain Christie what happened to him. Look at all these wrecks that he's been involved in. The Nightingale was the first one in 1869. Then he was also on the Harvest Queen that was lost, the city of Buffalo, the Harvest Home, the E.R. Williams. Um, and I've dove a couple of these as a matter of fact. Um, I don't know how he got to be captain that long as a matter of fact, but uh, <laughs> pretty interesting. Now the story goes that they dragged the vessel off of the reef that a tug called the Magnet actually came in and pulled this vessel off. So imagine the surprise about five years ago when two friends of mine actually found this side scan of a boat that had been drugged down Spectacle Reef. So the thought immediately was, this has to be the Nightingale. This is the boat that had been salvaged and uh, uh, immediately all the press releases kind of went out that it was until they took a look at the cargo. This was loaded, the Nightingale was actually loaded with uh, iron ore, which was largely salvaged. You don't take a boat with all that good gear on it and good cargo and drag it into deep water and not take the good stuff off of it. So this is largely stripped down and you can see, I mean, there's nothing. The anchors are gone, everything's gone, but the cargo on this one is actually coal. So the question is, is this the Asia? 
uh, or the Winslow. There's a couple of wrecks that were on there, but because it was dragged down, it's very, very suspect that this has to probably be the, the Nightingale. And maybe we're seeing some of the coal from the boiler that was on board or something like that. Here's the early designs. Uh, they were very worried, uh, Orlando Poe was very worried about the ice buildup in the straits. Here's the problem. We get windrowed ice that flips up. So this could be four feet thick, but when it flips up or windrows, now all of a sudden it freezes into a block that can be 16 to 30 feet tall. In fact, the first keepers had to chop their way into 30 feet of ice to get into the lighthouse. So a traditionally built brick lighthouse would be pushed right off of its pedestal. It wouldn't work. So Poe's entire design had to be something that would resist this. And you can see by the drawings, they expected those icicles to be pretty big. Here's uh, how they came up with a way to actually interlock those together. And they're using stretchers here, and then they have keys that come in. And these were originally going to be made out of granite, and he had a great contract from a guy that promised him all the granite he needed in Duluth. The guy was a shyster. He disappeared soon after. I think the only thing that saved him is he was actually killed in one of his uh, expeditions, and the government didn't come after him. But he had the initial contract, so now they had to scramble to figure out where are we going to actually find something to build this dimension stone to carve these into pieces. And where they found it was at Marblehead. So this is the same area that we saw those big blocks on Wagashans. There's a quarry that's right up here, and they call it Marblehead because it's a big, flat, open, looks like a Marblehead, and that's why the sailors would, would call it that there. And this is the Marblehead area right here in the town, and here's a quarry right here, and I've always wondered, where's the quarry at? You know, I mean, no one's ever written about where two of the most famous lighthouses on the Great Lakes, Spectacle Reef and Standard Rock, came from. So I told my wife, well, we got to go out there. Let's pack up our stuff and take a look. So I did a couple aerial surveys, and... This is one from the early 50s, and I could see Clements Quarry here, and you could see where some of it's already kind of filled in. So it had to be in this area. This is all, though, protected by the DNR for the uh, Lakeside Daisy. So when you go here, I snuck over to this side of it because I couldn't step on these. This is the, their pride and joy. This is a, a type of daisy that will only grow in limestone, uh, alkaline kind of a, a soil. And the whole area, when those things come to bloom, it's gorgeous. But the DNR is very protective. So I kind of snuck around and did like a minefield thing to get, because you're supposed to stay on the path, but I wanted to at least look at the rocks that were around there and uh, check it out. And this probably isn't Alex Clement's quarry, but it's pretty close. So if you look at Spectacle Reef up close, where you can see they've hammered this in, you look and you say, wow, that's good detail, but what are these guys right here? Well, limestone is from an ancient ocean, right? And how do we have an ancient ocean in Michigan? It doesn't make a lot of sense. This is the rugose coral that actually makes up these reefs that they actually carve these things out of. How did it grow in Michigan where we're too cold and we didn't have salt water? Well, if we go back 400 million years ago, Michigan was below the equator. So before our tectonics pushed us all the way up to here, Michigan was right down here. And so it was a saltwater ocean. And this whole area and this was really developed. Um, the saltwater that's below us right now is actually one of the largest salt deposits that's been used um, worldwide for salt. In fact, I've, this is one of my new lectures is to talk about Bay City's role, Saginaw's role in the salt market, which uh, was huge for uh, especially 1860 to the 1900s. Um, but that's, they take full advantage of the ocean water that was once here. So this moves up and this breaks into North and South America. And then we get these big block stones that are easy to carve. The blocks were also used in the first Sioux lock. You can see them right here as they're tearing it apart to put the Poe in. It was also uh, the design that uh, Poe came up with wasn't really revolutionary because John Smeaton actually came up with a, for Eddystone Light, which was an ocean light out in the middle of the ocean that um, needed that protection. He came up with that interlocking, and we saw it also used at Minot's Ledge, which had been pushed over in a big storm, and they wanted one that would survive. And you see a couple of different examples, but he came up with his own design for those stretchers that definitely made it unique. When he put it all together, it became a red and white alternating light. This is a, a second order lens, so this is the most powerful on the Great Lakes, but we don't have any first class lights. Those are like in Hawaii and places like that, so they really need to go out. But this light's pretty respectable. You can see it for 18 miles when it initially came out, you know, running on oil and then eventually moving over to, uh, um, to kerosene. 
uh, $406,000 to build it. So again, the, 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 the cost was astronomical at the time, way more than any other lights. And the design was so unique that they actually built a model that toured the Atlanta Exposition, the Chicago Exposition, the World's Fairs. They were so unique on how it looked. Um, one of the tragedies, though, is when you have a lighthouse that's out in the middle of Lake Huron, uh, people have to go to that lighthouse. And in the initial cause, um, the, the, the marshals were supposed to go out there um, early on with a steamship, but on Mackinac Island, the steamship broke down. So they said, well, we'll take a sailboat and we'll go out there. And that would have been fine, but a big storm kicked up. So as they got past Round Island and kept going, uh, the boat heeled over and unfortunately flipped. And uh, James Marshall, who was the third assistant keeper on board, drowned. Actually, he froze to death. He was on the boat, and they drifted into shore where the keepers came in, and two fishermen, Alfred and uh, his brother, um, they, they say Carden on here, but Kedru is actually the name. I had to chase that down because even the Medals of Honor are actually spelled wrong for some reason. But these guys went out, pulled them off, and the, the son, James, said, save yourself, Dad, and then died um, from exposure. And as you look at this, it says the body of the drowned man was recovered 24 feet of water and buried Thursday. The survivors are on a train now Thursday, but then they're going to go back to go back to the light. And I, I, as you go and do these searches for these people, you get a little more background on it when you realize that this keeper, uh, Mr. Lasley, actually cut his leg very badly and uh, actually decided to go to a bar and celebrate his survival. And if you read it, it says he was showing his scars in a saloon and he didn't, wasn't satisfied with showing his shins. He had his pants half off before he was caught and compelled to put them back on again. Uh, I, I did notice that Mr. Lasley did not go back to Spectacle Reef. He was transferred to Beaver Island soon after, so uh, it didn't work out, I think. Um, sadly, though, he passed away not too long after that. Um, the other incredible story is here you're out in the middle of, uh, of a lake and think of the Coast Guard cutter guys coming in in the spring. They walk in and they realize everything's unlocked at the lighthouse and they look on the kitchen table and there's a note and it's from a pilot who says, I crashed on an ice floe, I floated to this light, I tried to use the lamp to send SOS messages, I ate all your food and I took your binoculars, the ice looks good enough now that I might be able to make it and he took off and, and William uh, Wyman was never seen again. So this poor pilot had crashed just off this remote lighthouse and really thought that he could make it to shore. They're very much looking for this airplane. In fact, many of the divers, including the guys that found Nightingale, have been searching while well, we're over here. Here's a primary search area and it's really deep, 300 in this corner, 230 in here for that little airplane. He was an Air Force guy, and I don't know why he was taking his own airplane. You can't land your own private aircraft at Kinross, so I, I don't know why he did it. Maybe he was gonna keep it at the um, Sioux and uh, fly around, but uh, his last place that he landed was here in Saginaw, and, and just, just not too far from us, and refueled and then vanished. This is a picture Terry Pepper took of me at Spectacle Reef. It's a really cool light, and they're doing a lot of cleanup right now on it. In fact, I've got a quick little video I want to show you of some of the work that's going on by strictly volunteers that have taken on trying to clean up this. And when you see how dilapidated, and especially the paint is hanging down, you'll be pretty impressed. Over 15 miles from the mainland of Michigan's Lower Peninsula, one of the nation's most remote lighthouses is signaling a volunteer. My name's Robert Mativier, and uh, Recently, I started doing my family heritage, looking back in the past, and I found four of my great-great-grandfathers worked here. Three of them were blood, the fourth one was through marriage. Louis Mativier reported for duty at Spectacle Reef in 1887. Henry Mativier was here two years later. He transferred in 1894 to nearby Bois Blanc Island, where he retired when the light was deactivated. Joseph Mativier was also a keeper here from 1910 to 1916, so it wasn't a surprise that their descendant would be interested in duty here on the east end of the Straits of Mackinac. You know, I got pictures and stuff, and uh, I, I want, like, I didn't know what they did, you know. I didn't know that they were saving people and stuff. It's like when I walk through there, um, it's like I'm taking the steps they were taking. But when I found they're restoring it, I'm like, I need in. I need to be part of this group, like, forever. Pat McKinstry knows exactly what Rob is feeling. But the instant I saw this lighthouse, I ran up here and I hugged the tower. And they have pictures of me. 
I think I was probably wearing the same clothing actually that day, just hugging this light tower looking stupid, you know. This kinship is from 20 years of researching and working at lighthouses around Michigan. Pat said his fascination came from a trip to the Straits, where an abandoned light was found nearby. And when I was a little kid, probably four or five years old, um, there was a lighthouse in Mackinac City, called Mackinac Point, and at the time it was um, really bad shape, bore it up, wasn't open. And I thought, what is that? She says, a lighthouse. I said, can I go in it? She goes, no. Well, why? No one lives there. Why? You know, you pay the 30 questions of why. And then finally, the last question was, you know, I asked her why again. And the last response was, because nobody loves it anymore. And I was hooked. The state of Michigan took over the Mackinac Point light and restored it. But over 100 lights in the state don't have government protection. Pat started volunteering at Saginaw's rear range light when he was a kid, mowing the grass and learning maritime history. You know, these structures were built with taxpayers' dollars by people 100, 200 years ago to save the lives of the sailors on these boats, like this one going by. And those sailors never met the light keepers, and the light keepers never got a thank you. They lived in you no know, very, in some cases, remote, isolated conditions. You don't see another human soul for three months at a time. And you know they, they dedicate their lives to saving the lives of sailors on boats. Like what's ironic, they're going behind us here now. Pat joined with a half dozen other lighthouse enthusiasts to form the Spectacle Reef Preservation Society, a nonprofit group that bought the lighthouse and have been raising funds for its renovation. The growing membership sees the team's dedication as the board of directors work alongside them. The people that work in this society, you know, they're all awesome. This weekend, the goal was I'm going to send people up here, burn our scrape up here, because that entire wall doesn't need it. Most of this wall doesn't need it. Most of the ceiling doesn't need it. So we're going to scrape what's loose. And then we can paint and encapsulate it, and then we can bring those bunk beds up here and just turn it into a bunk. The workload for the first few years will be heavy as volunteers clean up nearly a half century of falling paint and other debris. It's tedious work under protective gear as lead paint was detected among the colored layers. It will have to be encapsulated so members can safely sleep here once again. You slap it on, huh? Oh, I'm still cleaning. Job is really tough, but then when you got half a dozen people helping you with that job, it's so much easier. And I love that. Pat says chores will always be a part of the experience here. You're gonna have a jobs. So you're gonna have to have to help wash windows, you have to help paint the buildings, you're gonna have to, you know, perform some of those duties that keepers performed. So you get a real taste of what it was to be a light keeper out here. It's pretty amazing. You see the light, the uh, rainbow that came to while we were doing the talk. You see the boats that close and actually spend time out there battling the spiders that seem to make it out there as well. I don't know what it is about lighthouses and spiders, but man, do we see some monsters. This is another great lighthouse off of, um, really it's off of Launce. So if you think of Marquette, this is Munising over here. The Huron Islands are right up here. Launce, by the way, has the best sweet rolls ever if you go to the hilltop. And speaking of hilltops, look where they put this lighthouse. This thing is 163 feet solid granite. So it didn't take a genius to figure out what they'd build this lighthouse out of. They'd build it out of granite, which was actually cut right out of the quarry right over here. So they had to haul it over here, trim it up, and actually uh, build the lighthouse there. For me, the best part was meeting one of the uh, former keeper's kids that came out. So here's the Campbell family. Um, for the longest time, these lighthouses were stags, meaning only men could come. Um, but the islands, they got a good argument during the summer to be able to bring their families out, especially if you look at this, this is where the first the, the keeper would stay here. And there's a whole other building on the other side where the assistant keeper's family could live away from them. So even if I guess you didn't like kids, you could at least have, you know, your own little place here. For these guys, this was an amazing vacation spot to go out. Um, but Dick said it was also a lot of work too. If you think about being up here, what do you do for a drink of water? You can't drill through solid granite all the way down there. So this is what Dick had to do to get water. Water was a, quite a problem because uh, there was no running water up here or at the fog signal at the other end of the island. So we had to carry all of the water. We carried in buckets. Anybody that went down the hill near the lake automatically had to take a couple buckets and bring back water. 
And sometimes it was quite embarrassing in the middle of a warm night to get up and find the water pail empty and someone forgot to bring water. And that didn't go over very big. So we had to do it for cooking, for everything. And that was, it created quite a problem for my mother because when you try to cook for one thing or do any washing or anything, you don't realize how important water is. And that was one of the things that, that uh, was very important was to get those buckets filled and get them up here. To be able to have Dick show us around, I mean, this is the, the status of their assistant keepers. They haven't done anything but clean it up a little bit, you know, so to have the studs still out there, there's actually a group now, preservation group, that's working on Huron Island. This whole area was, was formed by Teddy Roosevelt to be a bird sanctuary now, so it's difficult to go um, get access to many of these areas, but they, hopefully the, the plan is to actually make this into a place. It's a gorgeous lighthouse, and look at those custom uh, rock, you know, the rocks built right out of, uh, they also used, um, this stone came out to build uh, a spectacle, or a, forgive me, standard rock as well. Of course, I went there, I knew there were shipwrecks around, so I brought my scuba gear and uh, plunged into the water, and I had heard about the Arctic, which was a big passenger vessel that crashed before the lighthouse was built. There's actually an island called Cattle Island, and it got its name because the cattle were all pushed off the boat, and they all swam to this island and were later rescued. Um, so I wanted to find the Arctic. I only found little pieces, but the Nestor is very close to there, and, and Kevin shared a picture of this with me, Nestor being a giant barge that was actually built in Lantz, <clears throat> used in the, the lumber era. The sad part being, though, that the, uh, the Nestor went around the island. There was a Coast Guard ship that was hiding on the other side of Huron Island that didn't even know what was going on, and the uh, Nestor crashed ashore, and it actually hit so hard that the, the keepers ran out there. Sneed Whitty was one of them that ran out there and wanted to throw him a rope. And they're saying, save me, save me. And all of a sudden, a piece of the shipwreck flew up 50 feet and dislocated the keeper's arm, trying to save him. He ended up going back to Detroit. This storm was major. It uh, sank the Russia. This is actually a photogrammetry uh, image of the Russia that they just recently found. You can see all the cabins. It's an amazing condition. And of course, I had a lot of time during the last uh, uh, COVID where uh, I, PBS cut 13 of us. So I'm like at home writing books. The new uh, Bottle Goodbyes and Fitzgerald are good examples. But I'd spend my summers on board the boat at Whitefish Point. They need guys to pull the, and gals to pull the cables. Uh, that we put 500 feet down to look for a shipwreck, we've got to pull 500 feet back up. And luckily, one of the ones I went and we discovered was the Adela Shores that went down in the same storm. So it's pretty incredible. This is the Boyd. It's a great boat for uh, exploring shipwrecks. Look at how we have perfect fog here. And so we're sounding our fog horn to make sure ships don't run into us. And we're pulling the fish to actually locate it. And then we lower down this $150,000 robot that'll go down and actually fly. And Daryl will put it right on the wreck. So here you see him flying by the propeller. And we're trying to figure out what boat it is. Many times, like the Atlanta from Bay City, we had the name right on it. Um, many of the boats we can tell by the cargo. If it's a barge full of uh, lumber, uh, we've got a special on National Geographic uh, next month. This is us coming home, though. This is how fast Gitchagumi will turn on you. We came back, and uh, many people put on their life jackets uh, just because it was tossing and turning and definitely uh, giving you respect for how fast the big lake can actually kick up. But we got to see much of the, the wreck and a uh, lot of great stories that come out of there. Standard Rock is one of those ones that they, they've always said it, it was so dangerous, but I can't find a single wreck that ever hit it. Um, it's it's d interesting that it's a thousand feet deep, you know, in this area here, the deepest part of Lake uh, Superior, and this mountaintop comes up in the middle of the lake. So imagine if you're sailing along and you're on board the J.J. Astor and your name is Charlie Stannard and you see this rock with seagulls sitting on it, you know, you've got to tell somebody that there's a problem out here that if you're, you know, sailing along thinking you'll never hit anything because you can't see land from there. So they decided they were going to name this for Charlie Stannard, who was an incredible captain. This is actually the, the, the ship that he was on. This is at uh, Fort Wilkins. They brought the keel up and it's actually part of the uh, park up there. Sadly, they should have left it underwater. It would have been much better preserved. Um, it's probably not much left, but the rudder is also there as well. Um, and Charlie Stannard, 
actually took on the uh, Western world. That was the biggest uh, steamship at, of the time. So it's almost like our Edmund Fitzgerald. He became captain and then had a heart attack while he was at the wheel and passed away. And they buried him in Fort Erie, which um, is a pretty cool cemetery. It, it's, it's very gothic kind of looking there. And this, this obit was so powerful. It says, um, peace to his ashes and may he who guides the storms and winds protect and watch over the partner of his life and little flock to so his family. Um, but unfortunately, his, his ashes did not have a lot of peace because if you know the Erie Street Cemetery, it's right next to oh. Progressive Field. So Charlie's grave is right here on the third baseline, right on the outfield. <laughs> They moved him, and, and before you're like, oh, wait a minute, what? anybody who's been to the Eastern Market, that's actually a huge graveyard, too, that they actually moved as well. So the first steamship built in Detroit's graveyard um, was built out there, too. So this was standard practice, but interesting that Charlie's uh, legacy is there. Here's the rock. This is actually the day mark that they put a pedestal up, and they put a big cage here. And, of course, Lake Superior just laughed and pushed it right over. And they realized they'd have to build something just off of the, the light itself and so they put up this massive light and luckily they had all the tools left over from Spectacle Reef so Poe just said keep your team together let's move up here and they did they trimmed a hundred thousand dollars off their bill because you know they went up there and actually were able to uh, do all the work you know instantaneous unfortunately it took five years to build it and so many times you know with the storms it was impossible to get out there this is one of the longest keepers that, that was actually out there. He's sitting on that Daymark block right there, and there's his light. This is Lewis Wilkes, 99 days on a shift. Now think about that, it's about 50 miles off of Marquette. The nearest land is the Keweenaw, it's 29 miles out. Uh, he loved to play solitaire, apparently, and you could probably play a lot of it there, but 99 days, Wilkes, and uh, one of the stories that he told was about how there was a fire on Isle Royal, and one of these loaning aircraft, these amphibians, ran out of gas and landed right next to the lighthouse. So they came out. It turns out their generators were all burning gasoline out there, which is not smart on a lighthouse at all, as we'll find out. But they could refuel this, and they even dumped some ether into the tank and then tied a rope around the tail and let him gun it a little bit so he had good power, and then he could take off, and they, they saved the crew, and they were given accommodations for doing that. So standard rock bean right out here. Here's your Keweenaw coming up, and the, the actually got those people back into the air. Um, 1857 is when we see electricity start coming to the lighthouses, but standard rock will not be electrified until 1941. So here's a, a generator system that's sitting out on this, this big rock that uh, is highly explosive, and that led to a very deadly explosion that happened on standard. And the story that I'd always been given is that the electrician came on board and the generator sat right here and he was putting the brushings together and a spark happened and blew it up. The problem is the Coast Guard reports are all gone. We can't find them. They're, they're vanished um, from National Archives, from the Coast Guard uh, uh, historian. There's nothing out there on what happened from this. So I thought, I worked in television, why don't I go find the guy that got blown up? You know, let's, so I did in Florida, I found him. And sure enough, he said he came up, he was from St. Ignace, he climbed up here, came on board, smelt the gasoline, tore all the brushes and everything out of here so it was inert and then said, well, I want to go eat a sandwich. So he climbed up into the kitchen, which is right here, made a sandwich and started watching Candid Camera on TV. And that's when, boom, the TV went flying out the window from the explosion that happened. And what had happened was the station keeper came down to have a cigarette and vaporized himself. They only found his watch. That's all that they found. So here's the guy that actually was involved in that. Anyway, after it blew up, I had a big hole in my leg and barefoot and got burned pretty good. Went to Horn and we were going to put the lifeboat in the water and leave. Well, the wind caught it, the lifeboat. So the lifeboat took a hike. Horn dove in the water 34 degrees trying to get the boat back. Well, he couldn't catch up to it. It was blowing pretty good. So we just went there for five days and nights waiting for the wood rush to come get us. Now think about that. They're out on this light, 
and they're waiting for this boat. What happened? I mean, every morning they're supposed to check in. And the problem was that the wood rush was over in Keweenaw. There's a huge lightning storm. So for three days, they couldn't get a radio signal out of Cleveland to let them know that they hadn't heard from Standard Rock. The story goes that they tied two transmitters together to get a signal out to the wood rush. And when they keyed the microphone, they blew up television sets in Cleveland. Now, I don't know if that's possible. Maybe my engineering friends can tell me if that's true. But the wood rush went out there. And the wood rush got me and lowered me over in a, one of those stretchers like that. I mean, it wasn't flat. I was about to fall out of it. I remember I ate a quart of ice cream, went to sleep, and woke up three days later. They got the coat cut off and all that stuff. So by the time you woke up, you were at Houghton then? Yeah. Then Newsweek magazine ran an article. My sister saw it, and I have never seen her before. So she called me up, so I went and saw her after I got out of the hospital. They thought I did it. I said, no, I didn't have the generator running. I said, it was in pieces. They said, we can tell it's in pieces. I said, I mean, it was a part. I had the whole end bell off of it and everything. I didn't know what to do with it. I told them that Maxwell went down to have a cigarette, because I know he did, because I smoked it then, and he went down there and about 20 seconds later up it went. So they're stranded five days with a tarp and a can of beans. That's all they could get. The lighthouse is on fire because inside the coal that was in reserve there is burning. So it's just creating the smoke that they couldn't get inside. Here's some of the explosion. Look at the glass still blown out. These scientists are actually going up to put monitoring equipment there. It's important to, to monitor this far out in the middle of the lake of evaporation on the lake so they understand storms better. It's a perfect place to go. This is an area, this is for birds to keep them off of the, uh, the lens right there. And again, massive spiders that live around here. If we could just harness the power of those spiders. Here's and the anemometer that was on there, if you saw that last picture. I went up, in fact, um, they had a bunch of equipment that was on the deck, and when we got there, they said, well, it's not here anymore. So they had $60,000 worth of monitoring equipment that was swiped off the deck in one July storm. So as we talk about November gales, Lake Superior, that was a 30-foot wave that came up and cleared it. And I told the scientist, I said, if you want me to get my gear on, I'll go pick it up for you. And he goes, nah, we're at college. Somebody else will pay for it. <laughs> said, yeah, me. <laughs> Here's the Detour Reef Lighthouse. This is another fantastic one that's in the strait. So as you go um, up off the strait into Lake, um, this is going off Lake Huron into St. Mary's River. This marks the opening to go up to the Sioux Locks. So it's a good location to have a light. Originally it was just like Whitefish Point, a skeletal light that was actually on land. But once the ships got heavier, they went deeper out into the water off the point. So they had to move this off to the end of the reef. Well, of course, this is the 1930s and they want to save some money. So they recycled all of this tube and all of the lantern right here and they brought it out built a crib and moved it out like a boat and then sank it down there and then filled it with rock and cement and then added the columns this kind of art deco lighthouse to it and then with these gin poles lowered that entire um, lantern right in there and it's pretty incredible the 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 people that stay out there in fact i'll, I'll let you meet them how are we doing on time Hopefully we're not taking you guys too long. I'll let you at least meet these folks to know what uh, it was like to actually be out there, especially when it was freezing. But as the temperatures continue to fall, this unique assignment turns dangerous. The crew knows to watch the wind direction when Lake Huron kicks up. Anytime we got, we got to the dock area and saw the flags flying from the, from the south wind, uh, we knew we were in trouble because it has, if the winds come out of the southeast, it has the whole entire lake, um, Lake Huron, to build, to build from. The Coast Guardsmen who lived out here were quite aware of a Michigan winter. Ron Frails got quite a lesson during his first trip to his new duty station. I remember come down and catch a ferry out there and it looked like a big old popsicle out there. And because a lot of ice on it. And uh, so to get in, you had to chip the little ice to get in. 
Well, they had power cable at the other, where the old lighthouse used to be. But the ice parted it, so we were out there with no, no electricity at all. Couldn't even, no radio, no nothing. It's no surprise that this California native found lighthouse life to be much better in July. Summer wasn't bad. It worked well. I chipped the face of it and stuff. And I remember a lot of chipping. Chip, 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 chip. <laughs> Paint, you know. Maintenance was a full-time job on Detour Reef Light. Jim Williams remembers a task that never seemed to end. The engine room floor out there, I did all by myself. Chipped it and painted it while I was there. Along with my other duties, you know, I did that. I'd do a section at a time and then prime it and finish it with finishing paint after I get all through with the whole, whole deck, you know. Today, the task includes the removal of countless coats of white paint blasted away by high-pressure sand and a man in a special protective suit. The work is difficult, but the Coasties laugh when you compare it to their daily duties. No, I had a hand scraper and a, and a, and a chipping hammer. That was it. Pretty interesting. The, the, the almost a million point two, I think, put into this lighthouse, and uh, the way they financed it was pretty incredible. Um, you can stay there in a bed and breakfast. It's more of a keeper program. I highly recommend it. And in fact, Scott, my friend that uh, worked at WIOG, and I went up there, and we were going to stay. This uh, um, these two people right here, a daughter and a mom, were going to stay in the same room as us. And I realized how badly I snored. That's not going to be very nice to somebody who paid top dollar to be out there. So I told Scott, let's grab the, the cushions from the foghorn and we drug them all the way up into the lantern and laid them out there and just opened up the doors and watched the lights shine into the uh, Lake Huron all night. It was just an amazing time to be up there for sure. Do you have time for one more light? Can you hang out for one more? This is a St. Helena light, and it, it means a lot to me. As a former president of the Great Lakes Lighthouse Keepers Association, um, this is one that means a lot. We had two, the Sheboygan light and uh, St. Helena, which is out right in the straits. So as you look at the Mackinac Bridge, it would be right about here. And there's that island just as you go over. And if you see it, you'll see just a little white sliver as you cross north on your left-hand side as you go up the bridge. This is how it looked for years and years. In fact, sadly, hunters would go over there. They had rabbits on this island that were as big as dogs. So the hunters loved to go up there and hunt them. Um, but unfortunately, they'd go inside here and they'd set fires to stay warm or whatever and just burn the heck out of this light. And uh, luckily for the lighthouse, they found a, a very unique resource for people to actually fix this light. And it was done through Boy Scouts. Few scouts can boast an early summer camping trip to a deserted island, but Ann Arbor, Michigan's Troop 4 has visiting privileges every year. The boys and their families have worked with the Great Lakes Lighthouse Keepers Association for over 20 years, restoring St. Helena Island Lighthouse to its original splendor. So for my eagle, I am finishing the inside of the tower, so I'm restoring all three cabinets that are in there, and I'm putting trim on all the windows. Over 21 Eagle projects have graced the island, repairing buildings, creating shower facilities, and restoring banisters in the keeper's dwelling. Well, I just really like history, and it seems that there is a lot of history surrounding the lighthouse, so it just makes it really fun. The scouts not only plan their Eagle projects, but find donations and materials as well. And they're always encouraged to bring along adult volunteers who can help. The key to my way of thinking is we didn't just ask kids to come, because there's only so much kids could have done. They were good at cleaning up the brush, building a big fire on the beach. But when it comes to uh, putting up drywall, most kids, scout age, don't know where to start with drywall. The last time a lighthouse keeper ate a meal from this kitchen was 1922, but you couldn't tell that now. Nearly destroyed by mother nature and vandals, it has been meticulously restored to its original colors. St. Helena was once a thriving fishing village, but today is the protected home of snakes, rabbits, and nesting cranes. People only visit when there's work to be done. Our mission, Great Lakes Lighthouse Keeper's mission, uh, is to uh, understand the, the history of, of, uh, uh, of lighthouses, 
uh, and, and, and restore lighthouses, help in the restoration, the technology of uh, restoration. And, and the, probably the main thing is to develop a new generation of preservationists. You need ownership for tomorrow, huh? and, and we're doing that. We were digging under the privy to find uh, things that past uh, keepers have thrown down the privy. We found two intact bottles, and there's tons of glass shards down there, and like fractions of plates. Scouts have plenty of time to enjoy Lake Michigan and learn more about citizenship and knot tying, but the remote location means that they only have a few days to finish what they start. There is no power out here now, so we have to run up and down. There are 85 stairs, 52 round trips, plus the one I came up. Brush cleanup always leads to a lighthouse-sized bonfire, which can easily be seen from both the upper and lower peninsula. It's nearly time to return home, even though there's still work to be done. And next year's work is already bringing excitement to the troop. I'd hate to see an end to it. You know, I think it's probably a, an opportunity for boys to see a lot of service, to see what good service is. It's an opportunity for them to see, the, to have a feeling of preserving history. It's uh, an opportunity for them to see, be a part of restoration. Feel they, when they leave the island, they all have an ownership in it. I think that's to this, each and every scout, you know, that they feel an ownership in it. And I think that'll be perpetuated in their life. It really is done, you know, just like Saginaw River here, that it's through your donations, it's through your volunteer work. They can't do it without, you know, obviously this had the, the scout help, but uh, literally these groups are struggling to try to find members to come out to uh, actually do it. Yeah, Don? Richard Bowl was instrumental in saving the Saginaw River rear range light. He was instrumental in it. Without him, it would have probably never been saved. Amazing guy. Dick was a great guy, and I'm so glad I got to meet him. Um, really, Mr. Lighthouse and Terry Pepper as well. If you've ever read anything on lighthouses, it probably came from Terry Pepper. Uh, I'm lucky to hang out with this kid. This is my son, Alex. So I've got a historian in the family. I've got a, a my daughter was so much smarter to go into medicine. So <laughs> Jamie's got a wonderful career there. My two boys work in video too, as well as I do. And they're both much more accomplished at it, as a matter of fact. But Alex single-handedly saved the Charles Lee Mansion in Saginaw. And this kid just, I couldn't be more proud. He's a good guy. Here's a wreck that's right next to, uh, if you go towards the shoal, you actually see Grow Cap. If you've ever been to the mystery spot, the scariest place in the UP, Mick, for sure. Uh, the, the Grow Cap Road is right there, and this shipwreck was actually trying to find that cove, and it was actually loaded with Upper Peninsula stone. These are giant sandstone blocks. At one time, that red sandstone, if you go to Marquette or any of the Houghton especially, all the buildings are made out of this incredible color. Um, unfortunately, about the time that these were taken out, this is actually 1895, um, it was turning more in vogue to be marble in Chicago. These were supposed to be a bank building when the storm hit and uh, sank them. There's actually numbers carved into there from the quarry, and this is where the quarry is. This is the Keweenaw right here. So if you go around Marquette down to the Grand Island right there, Lower Peninsula right here, this is where the quarry is, and here's those blocks that they actually cover out. And you can see them right from your boat as you go over. Uh, this is actually uh, Chuck Feltner who brought up the windlass. And again, you know, it was good to bring it to the park, but the sad part is it wasn't, you know, preserved. And now all that's left is these two bands right here. The rest of it rotted away. It would have been fine underwater. So we'd like to leave those on the bottom as much as we can. Somebody also at the library in St. Ignace turned it into a desk. Um, so again, these wrecks, you know, we're not replacing these. Thank God we're not having more shipwrecks. But these schooners that are 100, you know, 200 years old, in the case of the Griffin, it's 300 years old. We don't want people making tables out of it. You know, these are historically significant. Um, this is another wreck that crashed into St. Helena during the 1940 storm. And of course, every youper cheered because their fuel needs were met by pretty much uh, for the entire, all you had to do is drive out on the ice there, which is a little risky. We've seen a couple of trucks on the, uh, on the bottom of the Great Lakes from people who do this kind of a trip. And the Peterson was one of those ones that actually made it through the storm, the crew made it. Um, but my story on uh, the wheelsman actually goes into one of the guys on the Novadoc that was also um, on board that, that uh, Novadoc when it went down. So if you wanna learn anything from those books, we've got them here at the library. My brand new Edmund Fitzgerald book is here as well. Um, super excited about 
well that's 300 pages and it's not just my opinion it's all written on the guys that built the ship sailed the ship and literally the guys that dove it from Jean-Michel Cousteau all the way through the Coast Guard and I went through meticulously every one of the tapes that we had from the Coast Guard and from my dive in 94 found all the little details that no one's written about and I decided to make it into a, a full story so I hope you enjoy them they're available here and of course the purchase obviously helps the River Society as well is there any questions about the lighthouses we covered St. Helena by the way just gave up its um, 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 solar array because uh, the kind folks at Enbridge actually bought them a brand new array so they could have power on the island so that they can run some equipment they need for monitoring equipment and uh, that whole system is going to go to South Fox now so they'll be able to energize that. It's an expensive outlay to try to get power in these remote places and so South Fox which is an amazing lighthouse maybe in our next talk we'll talk about that one. Uh, back in the corner over here though, yep? Yes, Rick, I had a thought. You mentioned about that we should just leave the things on the bottom. Sure. I wonder if it would be expensive, but I believe they did for the Confederate sub, the Hunley. They basically built an aquarium. Some of these things, if somebody had thought to do that, is there a way to preserve them in water? Oh, my Absolutely. And in the case of the Hunley, I mean, you're talking about one of the first really successful uses of a submarine where they actually attacked a ship and, and you know, did damage to it. So that made sense for the government to throw the millions of dollars that it takes to do that. Uh, we have fantastic facilities for shipwrecks at NOAA's facility in Alpena, and they have a full schooner that's actually sinking. If you go into their museum, you can walk on the deck and lightning's flashing around you and go down below. And in the front of the ship, it's actually a shipwreck. So it's a very cool place. We pay for it with our tax dollars, and I hope that more of us will go and see it because they don't have nearly the, the uh, attraction, I think, that they had initially said it would be. And they, they brought Bob Ballard in for um, uh, Alpina. Yep, if you cross the river and um, go down Fletch Fletcher, they've got a fantastic facility, and all of the artifacts that have been taken up, in many cases illegally, have been turned back into the state. They conserve them there. So you can see the captain of the Nordmere's hat. There's a chain link up here from the, the shipwreck. Um, his hat is there. You can see all of the, the figureheads from some of the shipwrecks, things that have been, uh, you know, didn't have money to conserve them. That's the sad part is a lot of people will dive down. In the case of the Lady Elgin, the worst open water disaster we had, uh, Harry Zike found it and brought up Civil War muskets, but there's no money to conserve them and they're turning into dust now. So it, it does take big pockets and there's not a lot of people that are going to stand in line to pay for that, unfortunately. So the best place really is underwater. And, and I'm talking totally spoiled here because I've got three kids that dive and, and three grandbabies now that better have tanks on by the time they're 12 so we'll make sure any other questions yes how come you said on the radio you're limited to 165 feet you can dive yeah to be for, because I'm a lousy diver, first of all. <laughs> I was talking very specifically. The average depth um, that we, we normally do for a sport diving depth is 130 feet, and that's because of the pressure that we go down to. And what happens is you go past 80 feet, the, the nitrogen inside your body starts to play with your brain. For me, at about 80 feet, I get paranoid. So I start thinking about mermaids and sea monsters and stuff. And when you can only see this far, you know, in the Great Lakes, it, it's very difficult, you know, to, to maneuver around. As I go past 100 feet, I start getting crazy. At 165, when I touch the deck of the Spengler, now, why would you do this? Well, here's this massive mast that's sticking up off the bottom. Both of the masts are up on the ship. It sank in the same um, relative week of when Abraham Lincoln Lincoln was um, elected president of the United States. And if you go down, the corn is still inside the shipwreck. So you go down the mast, and I'm hanging at 130, I'm at my limit, and I'm like, I've got to go down there and get a picture of that ship's wheel. It was gorgeous. So I go down, and I leave my buddy right here, and I said, you stay here. Remember, you don't have talking, so you kind of do, you stay here, and you watch me. And I go down, and I'm so out of my mind. It's like I had about 50 shots of whiskey, and this eye starts going way off here. Here, and this eye starts going way off here and I'm hitting every button on my camera thinking I'm turning it on. The video was horrible and it, now I'm so lucky because the, the, the museum has an incredible robot that can go down there and stay forever. It doesn't get cold, it doesn't
doesn't whine, you know, when we leave it down there. It doesn't get narked by the, 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 uh, the extreme depth. And more importantly, when I do go down to 165, I can't just come up. If there's a problem, I have to slowly come up and let my body acclimate to the pressure or I'll get the bends. So there's divers that are super talented and they can use helium to offset that nitrogen. And that allows them to go down clear headed to 300, 400. They even dove the Edmund Fitzgerald on helium. So you can dive to those depths. There, many of them are using rebreathers that are computers that take their breath, take the oxygen out, recycle it, take out the bad, you know, the, the CO2, and then allow you to breathe back in by augmenting the oxygen. I just don't trust the computers at that depth. I mean, I want to, I really do, and I want to see those things. But the truth is, when I've got such great toys with the museum, that makes a lot more sense to me. And there are certainly incredible divers that can go inside and penetrate these wrecks, but it makes me nervous as all heck. I will never tell somebody to go to get pictures for me when they could possibly not come back. That, to me, is the, the worst. I couldn't live with myself if that happened. That's why I was the guy at TV5 jumping out of airplanes. I was the guy that you know flew the jets or the biplanes and stuff. You don't want somebody else going to do something you wouldn't do. So um, I just think it's smarter to take the robot. Any other questions? Coming out on a blizzard to see me, I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your support of this amazing association, Don.